detail stuff, which is probably more useful during follow the speaker. Uh, but if you know that you've got another talk to go to, feel free to get up and, um, and just show the stuff to yourself. It will relate to the things that are on the screen uh, in the PowerPoint presentation. So there's a little experimental B hotel. There are QR codes for the website that I've created, which also has a lot of the same information as the um, talk. So feel free to pull one of those off of the... Uh, a, it's a paperclip, that's what it's called. Um, it's a little vial of native Tasmanian bees and some uh, reed bee tubes that they have uh, occupied for themselves so that you can just start to get a bit of a picture of what our native bees actually look like and actually need as resources in the ecosystem. So feel free to um, get up and have a look at those. Not everything in the box is uh, Tasmanian. Uh, there, I added some into the blank spaces, but I didn't have time to take the other things out. So there's some cicadas from New South Wales and, uh, and there's a great old big old carpenter bee from California to also highlight the difference between why um, broad spectrum bee hotel designs won't work, don't work. You can buy them, but the bees won't. <laughs> into entomology, which can become incredibly deep because I'm afraid of missing out. You know, if I pick one insect, I would be missing out on all of the other insects. Uh, if I became a specialist fly taxonomist, I might not get to talk to you about Tasmanian native bees. Uh, so this is uh, my current passion project. I started learning a little bit about what Tasmanian native bees require. Um, and yeah, here to share some of that with you all. So I know that you know, smart people that you are, that pollinators are far more than just bees. There's entire species of cactuses which if they opened their flowers in the desert during the day would get fried by the sun, so they open at night just for their moth pollinators to come along and drink the nectar in the cool of the evening. So I know that you know that. And I know that you know that pollination as a service to our human society is incredibly important. One in three bites of food that you have ever eaten was thanks to animal pollinators. 75% of the crops that feed directly into the human food consumption food chain, not the corn that we feed to cows, but the food that we feed to ourselves, 75% of those crops are dependent on bee pollination. I know that you know that that is important. I know as land carers and people who are engaging communities on your own urgent subjects, you also know that facts are not motivating to people for whatever reason. If they were, if facts were good enough, there would be no climate change denial, there would be no anti-vaxxers, and you wouldn't be constantly polling people to get them to care about your endangered species or your threatened habitat. So I wanted to make this talk very explicitly personal. And so, without pollinators, there would be no more hangovers. <laughs> Are you frightened yet? <laughs> There'd be no more hangover cures. <laughs> There'd be no more denim jeans and plain white tees. No more Lucas pawpaw ointment. What, what is a Tasmanian to do? No more rubber boots. Cotton is pollinated by bees. Rubber trees or fig trees are pollinated by fig wasps. Um, and this, just to explain the fun that is being had, this is peyote. It's a hallucinogenic <laughs> practice. <laughs> No more fun without pollinators. 
And so these are some of the Tasmanian pollinators, which are yours, which are part of your natural history, part of your inheritance of being part of the uh, Tasmanian community. So the average insect, the average earthling is an insect. The average insect is a beetle. So beetles are uh, entrenched in, in practically every role that insects play in our community, from soil cycling to breaking trees down and to pollinating insects. Uh, beetles are a major player in, in practically everything that happens in our ecosystems. Flies are also crucially important, incredibly valuable pollinators. There is uh, such a group of flies that are so committed and, uh, and focused on pollination that they are actually camouflaged to look like bees and wasps, even though they're completely harmless. It's a group of bee flies and also hoverflies. You can spot them from a distance because flies have little goblin antenna. And so no matter how good their camouflage is, they will always have this stumpy little antenna. Bees and wasps have proper insect antenna, and so you don't have to get too close to them to figure out. Uh, but they're not dangerous, they're just wearing the leather jacket. They want to look like wasps so that birds don't put them in their mouths. That is how committed to pollination bee flies and hoverflies are. And then, of course, there's a whole bunch of hangers on. The katydids, the earwigs, the native Tasmanian cockroaches, they all want the same thing from flowers. Pollen is packed full of protein and nectar is packed full of sugar. Practically everything living on this planet wants the same thing, energy. And so these, anything that is sitting on a flower has the potential to be transferring pollen between plants and is acting as a pollinator. I wanted to take a quick minute, it's a bit of an aside, but to uh, ensure that from this day forwards, Tekinidae, Tekinid flies will go unacknowledged no longer. <laughs> this is an entire group of flies. Tasmania has many different species. They're ugly, they're spiny, they're hairy, and they are dedicated pollinators. As adults, every single one of these species visits flowers and drinks the nectar. So they are active, dedicated pollinators. They also lay their eggs inside of those pesky herbivores which eat your vegetation, like caterpillars and beetle larvae. And so who wants honey when you could have a horrible, chest-bursting alien babies destroying your caterpillars and your other garden pests and pollination going on at the same time? Tekinid flies, I'm a big fan. <laughs> And so part of what motivated this talk is a lot of what I've been seeing in the bee media recently. There was the Save the Bee headline, which was a response to uh, what we observed a few years ago, which was colony collapse disorder. Uh, everyone was very interested in saving the bees. Now the headlines that I've seen more commonly are that we're saving the wrong bees. Uh, talking about how uh, people like yourselves might be better off focusing on native bees versus honeybees. And I know it is effective and almost necessary to speak confidently on a single viewpoint in a 10 minute uh, you know, presentation where you have to sound confident and focused and directed. And I'm going to attempt to highlight the pros and cons of um, all of the Save the Bee rhetoric. And you can um, kind of integrate that inside of your own minds. But yes, native bees are incredibly numerous, vulnerable, and valuable. And honeybees are also incredibly numerous, vulnerable, and valuable. So our agricultural ecosystems are completely dependent they are entrenched with the pollination services of honeybees. And that is for a really specific and I think quite interesting reason. We grow up knowing quite a lot about honeybees. They sting, you have to learn about them at a very young age to try to avoid them and not get stung by bees. Uh, and they are everywhere. They buzz around, they're kind of cute and furry. And we come away thinking that we know quite a lot about bees. The irony is, 
that the world has about 21,000 different species of bees, and 90% of those do not behave or live in the way that honeybees do. They are out on the real left-hand side of um, aberrant bee behaviour. 90% of bees live solitary lives, do not live in hives, completely different social structures. But it is because of that that makes honeybees domesticatable. You can't have a herd of zebras. Trust me, people have tried. Apparently it was a nightmare. Because they don't have a social structure. So you can't tame them. They'll kick over your fences and they run away. And you can't tame and you can't corral isolated, solitary native bees. But because honeybees live in hives, because they do the remarkable job of turning pollen, which we can't eat, and nectar, into a concentrated sugar food source, they have two things that people need enormously. And so we integrated them into our lives. And now you can pick up your beehive, move it to a place where you've got crops that need pollinating, and that is like targeted biotechnology. It's like a whole hive full of autonomous drones, only they are far more delicate and they are far more intelligent than any drone we could ever create for ourselves at this point in time. So bees have become incredibly important. And because they live in hives, they are vulnerable to or being killed off by pesticides that have been used in the fields that we drive them to. And they are vulnerable to picking up pathogens from other bees that they interact with in those fields. And they are vulnerable to taking them back to their hives where all of them die uh, because they live in these very confined spaces. So while honeybees are by no means under any threat of going extinct, we've got to be one of the most numerous species on the planet, there was definitely the risk when we were saving the bees that they fall below the population threshold which could service our crop pollination requirements. That's why we cared. Some reasons why you're saving the wrong bees, why you don't need to save the bees, why you don't need to save these bees. In Tasmania, explicitly, true for many other places where bees have been introduced to, these are larger bodies than our native bees. Tasmanian native bees can be incredibly tiny. And because of the thermal properties, larger body bees are able to get up earlier in the morning when it's colder and stay up later at night. And so they've got a longer foraging window. They've got the fridge door open for longer and they can take more food. And so they are able to outcompete our native pollinators. A lot of our native flowers are too small for honeybees and bumblebees to fit into, and so they will just steal the nectar. They chew at the bottom of the flower, take the nectar, they don't touch the pollen, nothing gets pollinated. They're thieves! <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> I think one of the significant issues that's come to my mind if people, individuals, are attempting to save the bees by taking up backyard beekeeping, you run the risk of creating more feral bees. If you don't take care of your hives properly, and this is one of the defences of apiaries, they're not truly domesticated animals. The bees can pack up and leave your hive whenever they want to. If they become dissatisfied with your beekeeping services, they will. Now, talking to um, the, uh, the Hobart City Council fire um, and, uh, and biodiversity team, <laughs> wonderful, uh, brought to my attention just a couple of days ago how intense the feral bee population problem is in Hobart. If you put a control burn across the domain and they say the sky goes black from all of the feral bee population that has come up out of the tree hollows. And so they are displacing all of our native animals that nest in tree hollows. And of course, they're not out near the crops where they can be focused and used as a targeted technology. They are in the inner city. And because honeybees live in hives, that's what makes them aggressive. They've got um, resources and a queen that they need to defend. Bumblebees can do a thing called buzz pollination. They flap their wings at a certain frequency, which causes certain flowers to open. Honeybees don't do that. And one of the crops that requires this kind of buzz pollination is tomatoes. And so honey bumblebees do have a valuable place uh, in the, uh, the human, natural, cultivated landscape. 
Tomato growers would dearly love to have better access to bumblebees because they do this specific kind of pollination that not many other bee species can. But they do all of the same negatives as honeybees, only sometimes slightly better because they're even bigger. They can get up even earlier in the morning, stay up even later at night. This is the, um, the nectar robbing I was talking about. Honeybees and bumblebees, if they don't fit into a flower, will simply kick the door down. Uh, the flowers fall off the plants, no seeds get made. It's common in uh, tube flowers like Coria or uh, X, uh, the Pacus impressor. But we cannot ignore dark blue, it's honeybees. We cannot ignore the backbone of uh, honeybee pollination services. However, you'll note here on some of our primary crops, the absolute benefit, the acknowledged benefit of these other bees. And so now we finally get into the part of the talk, who are these other bees? And why you might want to cultivate them in your landscape. Now, in some places, not so much Tasmania, but uh, definitely larger, warmer places where you have larger native bees, honeybees are actually a bit too efficient. They're too good at collecting pollen because they've got to take it back to the hive. And so they slip it down, they stick it onto their legs, and they actually have far lower transport of pollen grains compared to a lot of native bees, which are better pollinators because they are worse at collecting pollen. Check this guy out. <laughs> oh, she's just loving it. Um, and so bees that are worse at collecting pollen are better pollinators because they spread more pollen around. More pollen falls off, they have to fly to more flowers to pick up all the pollen that fell off the first time. And so some native bee species will visit 10 times more flowers to pick up the same amount of pollen. And so they can be extraordinarily over-efficient pollinators. Also, honeybees, I think of it as a little bit of diva attitude. If they are just in a monocultural landscape with just themselves and the flowers, they will fly from flower to flower to flower to flower, maybe move on to the next tree in the row, tree to tree to tree. Very focused. Again, they've got a queen to feed. But this means that they do uh, not spread the genetics around very effectively. But if they bump into a non-bee pollinator, they go, Ugh! and they will take off, fly to another tree, and um, better spread the genes around. Now, I have talked far too much about bees already, and so we'll skip a couple of slides. I just wanted to highlight every single photo in the next part is a different species of native Tasmanian bee. You don't need to know what they are. I just wanted to give you the impression of how many different native Tasmanian bee species there are for you to get to know. These are reed bees and resin bees. Burrowing bees, so these live in tunnels in the ground. Take note of some of the uh, different native or introduced plant species that they are living on. And banksia bees or masked bees, which are identifiable by this lovely little uh, pictures on their faces. So, how to cultivate these bees in your backyard? They need places to nest and they need things to feed on. Because our Tasmanian bees are incredibly small, it can be beneficial to have, if you're growing or planting, you need to put in small flowers that give a, a sort of a targeted nectar resource just for the small bees that will exclude some of the larger bees. And so we can see here some of the native plants that you might choose to include. Tea tree, calistamin, native peas, flowering gums. I think this is pig face. But of course, the bees aren't all that fussy and they will thrive on introduced species as well. So some native Tasman some Tasmanian uh, research has been done showing how many bees are supported just by the dandelions that are growing along the edge of the Midlands Highway. And so this isn't waste ground as far as bees are concerned. Blackberry, canola, roses, I think. You might like to take a photo of this slide. I'm not going to talk you all the way 
way through it. But if you're planting species, you want to put in things that will bring a lot of nectar into your location and will flower for a long period of time. But much like other types of landscape restoration, it's worth keeping in mind what the weeds in your location are actually bringing to your ecosystem. So gorse is not only valuable for pollinators, it of course makes a safe haven for things like the eastern barred bandicoot. And so if you tear out all of your weeds to make it a purer, more natural landscape, you can often be losing some of these resources which are valuable for the biodiversity support in your landscape. And then we get to the hotel making. We talk about this more in Follow the Speaker, I will wrap up. Bee hotels are based on good bee science. Like I said, 90% of the global bees live in solitary little holes that they make for themselves. But as I pointed out, Tasmanian bees are incredibly tiny. You could fit a mouse in that. And mice don't need more holes for us. Reed bees need pithy stems, blackberry, rose. Man fern. Cavity nesting bees need the holes that have been drilled into your fence posts and when you take the vault out, the cavity nesting bees will move in. This is a wasp mimicking bee using an old hole left by a beetle. And so I made a small website summarising basically the things that I've attempted to quickly introduce you to today. I have QR codes that you can take home with you and it will give you information on how to build bee resources into your backyard that are hopefully specifically targeted for Tasmanian bees and, uh, and not for all of those other bees and all of those other wonderful native bees in those other countries that are not our bees that are not here. <laughs>